Lord of our lives because Jesus, our Savior, our older brother, our second Adam, our representative, our high priest before your presence is now interceding for us. And we give you praise and honor and glory and thanksgiving and blessing. We ask you to enter into our worship and into our time with you that your word will stand strong in our hearts and in our minds. And we will be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's a high, that's a high calling, the pledge that we make to the flag and to this United States. You know, it came up in uh, 18, I wrote it down here, so I did it, 1891, they were about to celebrate the 400 years of the finding of America. 14, when did Columbus sail the ocean blue and come here? 1492. 1492. So in 1891, uh, there was a Francis Bellamy who was asked uh, by the principal to make a way for the children to become more patriotic, more respectful of their country. And so he came up with the first Pledge of Allegiance. It didn't look like this one we just did. It was missing the phrase, under God. Isn't it interesting? But it went over four revolutions, that uh, Pledge of the Allegiance. I want to go back just a little bit. Uh, do you remember when uh, Columbus found America? Who did he see? What were the people he saw? He called them Indians. And why did he call them Indians? He thought he was in India. <laughs> he was reading a map by a, another sailor whose last name was America. And uh, he thought he was in India. And so he called the Indians in America. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Just a little history you needed to know, the country you live in. But we get so, so narrow-minded when we think about the words and the names of things around us, and we don't think about the big, bigger picture. But why was under God not, not in the Pledge of Allegiance? And how did it get there? So I want to tell you about this pastor. He was the pastor of the largest church in uh, downtown Washington, D.C., the uh, New, York, uh, New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, Pastor DeCherty. Pastor DeCherty in 1954 was preaching, and he was preaching hard because communism was coming in strong in, in America at that time. President Eisenhower, you see next to him there, was in the congregation when he preached about one nation under God. That was his, it was his uh, slogan in his sermon. He said, I come from uh, Scotland and from England where they all pledge allegiance to a nation that's under God. And uh, why don't we have under God in our pledge of allegiance? And uh, Eisenhower was in the congregation going like, yeah, <clears throat> the commies are coming in pretty strong and I think we need to do something about that. And so June of that same year, uh, during Flag Day, he voted into law under God, into our pledge. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So it's there now because President Eisenhower was in church and heard it, and uh, it moved his, his uh, desire to follow that. And so there he was. But uh, he, Pastor DeCherty, he said this, to omit the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance is to omit the definitive factor in the American way of life. Would you say that's true? Amen. I believe that is true. I believe our nation was found by a people seeking freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of worship, and freedom of commerce. All of those things determine what Americans are all about. But it was because they had this inner passion to serve and honor God as God was revealing himself to them. He went on to say in his sermon, an atheistic America is a contradiction in terms. <coughs> I would say amen to that as well. But it's sad to know as prophecy unfolds 
when we when it's all shaken down, we're going to be more in the camp with the atheists than we are with the Christians because of this liberty and justice for all. You know, we have the right and the authority to assemble for worship just as much as the church of Satan. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? But our government stands for liberty and justice for all. If they're following the law of the land, they can worship any day in any way as they feel is necessary. But that's the freedoms we have in America. That freedom gave 2,000 African Americans and Pastor DeCherty in uh, 1964 the uh, I think it was 1964, yeah, they went down the Edmund Pettus Bridge protesting against the, the way that the South was blocking the African Americans from voting. They were making every excuse known to man why they shouldn't vote. Either illiterate or they're at the wrong place at the wrong time. They were just making up stuff to block them out of the voting privileges. And so this was a great protest against the South blocking the black vote. And that was a very brave thing, but it ended in shame and brutality. You remember at least 25 citizens went to jail that day, and made, but they went to the hospital first. One of them was a lady, Amelia Boynton, and another man, a young man, just 25 years old at, the, at that time, uh, Mr. Lewis. Uh, he was beaten down to the ground, almost to death. Uh, because America's stance against liberty and justice for all at that moment. Uh, so we've had our times in the past, haven't we? Uh, but Lewis, praise God, by 1985 he became the congressman of Georgia. He held on, and because of his allegiance to a country that proclaimed to be under God, was honored and was able to serve his country in a powerful way. Allegiance, how many, is, how many of us practice allegiance when the uh, IRS comes and says, <clears throat> or when uh, the traffic police say, <clears throat> or when uh, you know, any governing authority gets in the way of your freedom, you, uh, you have a hard time with it. So how far do we press our allegiance? And how far do we press under God? How far do we press indivisible? How are we doing on that one? By the way, boys and girls, boys and girls, let me get your attention. Have you heard the word indivisible? What do you think that word means? Indivisible. Kind of a strange word. We don't use it in our normal way of talking. It means what? Can't divide it. It's not dividable. Is our nation like that, do you suppose? When the Cowboys and uh, whatever other team plays, it's a little bit <laughs> hard, to, hard to tell. But even in a practical sense, our country is probably more divided today than I've ever seen it on a number of issues that we could spend a lot of time on. Let's don't waste our time on all of that modern stuff. Let's look at what God says. I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 33. You know, King Solomon, he was known as the wisest man for more reasons than just because he could settle uh, things judiciously. But he was wise because he turned his mind to God, the ultimate authority. When he was dedicating the sanctuary, the first sanctuary in Jerusalem, the one his dad thought he could build, but couldn't build because he was a man of blood, uh, Solomon took over. And there on the dedication day, he was praying before God. By the way, why was Solomon praying before the Lord? And why was there a dedication day? What was their real, what was their real focus? They needed the fire to fall. Moses dedicated the sanctuary in the desert, and it wasn't de dedicated until the fire fell on the altar burnt sacrifice. And Solomon was praying and asking God, please honor your word. 
They were following the blueprint that God gave Moses. And they were following the blueprint to build the sanctuary as God honored, God told them to do. And he said, I will be with you. I will dwell in your midst if you build me a sanctuary. And so he was praying. And this was his prayer in verse 33. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy. Why do you think he said that? What? When your people Israel are defeated. <laughs> you think he was precluding they were going to be defeated? All he had to do was look back a little ways. Over and over, Israel, hard-headed, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, turning to their own ways, turning against God's way. Solomon knew that the human heart is wicked and it is hard to steer. So he said, when your people are defeated before an enemy, because they have sinned against you, and when they turn their back to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this temple, then hear in heaven and bring them back to the land which you gave to their fathers. In, a, in the New English Version, it says like this, renew their allegiance to you. And that's what I'm asking us to do today. We pledge the allegiance to the flag of a United States of America, but our allegiance truly belongs with God. Amen. The, the nation that will never fall. The nation that will always stand. The place where we can always go with confidence with our prayer, with our petition, and know that if we will return to Him, He will return to us. He will hear our prayer. From the sanctuary, we have a high priest, don't we? He's interceding for us even now. If, we, if we've fallen, we can get back up with confidence because we know we have a high priest that stands in our behalf. And that's what Solomon was praying for. Thomas Jefferson, there was about four or five that, that wrote out the uh, Declaration of Independence, but they depended on Thomas to write it out. And they said, we'll do corrections, you write it out first. He was the the writing authority. But he said this after he had written it. He said, God who gave us life, gave us liberty. Now he was not a church going regular. He was kind of a deist, but he understood that God gave man his ability to live and breathe and have his being. He said, can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? That's what Solomon was talking about. Conviction that God is in control and our allegiance belongs to Him. We must follow our Lord and our Savior. What does the word allegiance mean? It's a noun, the loyalty the citizens owe to their country or subjects to their sovereign, as it would be in the, the kingdoms. The act of binding yourself Intellectually, emotionally, to a course of action. That's pretty, pretty heavy, isn't it? How is your allegiance to your country? How is your allegiance to your government? How is your allegiance to those serving in the government, serving to protect our land and our liberties and our, our declaration? I want to uh, bring in a uh, gentleman that served 10 years in uh, the U.S. military. I'm not sure what branch, but it was some kind of a special uh, service. Uh, his name, David Eubanks. You may know him. Dave Eubanks. He was a good Texas boy, and he served his country well. After he went to the, did 10 years with the, the U.S. military, he went to seminary. He served his Lord in the government. And in the military, he wanted to serve his Lord in spreading the gospel now. So he went to the seminary. About this time, he had learned, because he was raised as a missionary boy in Thailand. In Thailand, his parents were missionaries up in the Highland area. How many of you were with Jesus for Asia when they came here to, to El Paso? Jesus for Asia, they had one little lady. You remember the little lady? She lived up, worked up in the Highlands there in Thailand. Uh, I forget her name. Uh, anyway, she's got a newsletter. Y'all ought to find it. It's exciting. But that's where uh, Dave Eubanks was as a boy up in the highlands of Thailand. 
he had been, he began to learn about Myanmar. It used to be called Burma. They were neighboring, nation, neighboring countries. But in uh, Burma, communism was coming in. And they had had civil war over that because they're bordered with China as well. They had been getting supplies from China and China had been trying to infiltrate the government. For 73 years, they've been having a civil war in the country of Burma, Myanmar. And so Dave Eubanks graduated from seminary. He says, I am feeling the call of God to go back and help the people that I remember as a boy there in Myanmar in the upper highlands of Thailand. And so he was in love with Karen. Here's a picture of him, Dave Eubanks. He's 62 years old now, about my age. Lord have mercy. But he's still there. He's been there for over 25 years in Burma. He's been serving. Have you heard? You can look up in uh, your uh, Wikipedia. The uh, Free Burma Rangers. Free Burma Rangers. He's the one who started the Free Burma Rangers. And they uh, actually train the resistance forces up in the mountains that are being uh, pummeled by the government over and over and hundreds of thousands of them being uh, persecuted because the government is becoming more and more communistic. They're getting their armaments from Russia and uh, from China and it's just a horrible uh, mess going on here. But this man graduated from seminary. He says, Karen, if you're going to follow me and you're going to be my wife, we're going to Burma. <laughs> she said, sign me up. Their allegiance was to God. They were under the allegiance of the flag of America, but they went to a, another country that was in great distress, 73 years now, to serve voluntarily, without government pay, they were going to serve and help the Burmese people to have freedom and justice. And what they do is they, they, uh, they bring uh, medical supplies into these mountain villages that have just been strafed by bullets and bombs and by government authorized mercenaries going in and killing the people by the hundreds and thousands, year after year after year. And he's training these young people that are uh, saying, no more, we can't, we can't do this anymore. We can't let the government get away with murder, literally. So this was from uh, Jason Mutlow from the Rolling Stones magazine. He spent three weeks following Eubanks through the jungles there. The title of his article was Zealot or Savior, U.S. Minister who was also military, training rebels in a civil war. That's a new kind of allegiance, isn't it? <laughs> Here are his children. They all grew up there in Myanmar, Burma. Uh, the two girls are in their early 20s. The boy is 17. And uh, they're, they're uh, in a rally gathering courage amongst the lay people that are in that country being terribly brutalized by their government. But they're gathering with courage because they serve the Lord Jesus Christ, number one. But they're trying to help them fuse together freedom in Christ with freedom from a brutal communistic government. They have the, the largest group they're training just this year. Over 200 young people are going into training. They call Eubanks, who is pastor Eubanks, they call him Mad Dog. <laughs> Can you imagine calling your pastor Mad Dog? I don't think so. Uh, they also call him the father of the white monkey. I'm not sure what, where that one came from. But uh, he says, love is the force that drives me to take extreme risks. He will go in when a village has been strafed by, by the snipers and so forth. They can't even plant their rice during the day. They have to go out at night and plant their rice because they're picked off uh, by snipers. He went to that village and uh, he and his family planted rice and they were shot at. What they do is they get film of this, what's happening by this brutal government and they broadcast it to the rest of the world to say, we need some attention here in this country. This country needs help. And they bring medical supplies, but in the, in the meantime, they train the young men and women how to resist. And they pack heat. <laughs> they know how to use military weapons. 
Now, he's not providing those, but they know how to get them, and he trains them how to use them. And he gets physical with them. They said he could run 40 miles through the jungle and preach the gospel all in one day. He's a triathlete. And uh, he's training these young people how to have a godly rebellion against a godless country. Can you imagine what kind of an allegiance this is? He has three rules. Be literate. Secondly, never run when others can't. Thirdly, work from love because there's no pay in this rebel force. <laughs> Those are his three qualifications to become part of that uh, movement, Free Burma Rangers. There's actually a movie out, you ought to watch it, it's pretty amazing, this family. One day as they were uh, being interviewed, uh, they heard a Russian jet coming in low and they heard a, a blast. They went down the hill and found out that for who knows what reason, they blew up a, a church and the, uh, the uh, preacher was killed, who one of his daughters called her uncle, and uh, the deacon was killed, and a little lady uh, with her two children were killed uh, for, for no reason by the government. And they went there, and he said this to his daughter as he was trying to console her. You can live with sorrow, but you can't live with shame. You know, that's what keeps these young people working there in these very dangerous environments. How many of us have that kind of allegiance to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many of us? What is our command from our commander in chief, by the way? Let's say it together. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. That's our primary assignment to our commander in chief, our, our authority, Jesus Christ. He came and blazed the trail himself and he's asking us, are you willing to go and take the risk to plant the gospel to all nations? Amen? Amen. Our nation has had some hard times on this indivisible thing. You know, in the, what was it? 1864, 1861. About the time our church was being formed, 1863, our church form formalized. I was right in the midst of the Civil War. And there were, there were men and women on the bad side and on the good side. On the south as well as the north. And they were being asked to get arms and go kill each other. Killing church mem members over a civil dispute. Which happened to be over slavery. Can you imagine? Is that day coming in our country? Or we're going to have to make those kind of decisions. These are things we're going to really have to think through. Liberty and justice for all. How does that calculate in our actual uh, way of living and doing? And one nation under God. Well, this man, uh, John Brown, he was hung after he, he had a long series of plans to take the, uh, the armory, uh, what they call Harper, Harper's Ferry, Harper's Ferry Rebellion. There was a great armory. They had a, all the arms uh, supplied there from the north. And he was planning to raid the armory and take people like Harriet Tubman. He asked Harriet Tubman, to, Herbert Douglas, or what was this, Douglas? Uh, Frederick Douglas, he wanted him to come. Frederick said, you're, a, you're an insane man. He says, a good, good idea to rebel against slavery, but your plan to go take the U.S. Armory is crazy. But well, he almost pulled it off. And he had a lot of support. Harriet Tubman would have been there if she hadn't been sick. But uh, they went and they lost. And uh, they hung a few months later. But before this, he had a signed statement. As he was sitting on his coffin, coffin the coffin he was going to be put in before the hanging, he said, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land can never be purged away but with blood. He was willing to die for a cause that he believed, believed needed to be corrected. How about you and I? How is, our, how is our allegiance leading us? Well, John Brown was laid in the grave, and that didn't set well.
for those who were very anti-slavery. And so during this time, uh, there was a little ditty that came uh, up from a, from a Methodist hymnal. You know, the Methodists were really uh, coming through the Americas during that time. Uh, John Wesley, bless his heart, set the pace to go into every county and put the gospel on notice. Uh, and so the Methodist hymnal was quite familiar. And all the Civil War boys, they knew the songs from the Methodist hymnal, but they set it to a new tune. Da, 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 and it was about John Brown's body molding in the grave, and they're going to make right what he set out to do and finish the, the unfinished business. And uh, so this lady heard the boys singing that song, Julia Ward Howe. You can see it in the SDA hymnal, our closing song. Somebody tell me, what the what is the number of that hymn for our closing song? 647. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. She switched the words from the bones of John Brown molding in the grave to a gospel song. Is that actually allowable for us to take a secular song like that and switch it to a gospel song? We sing it, and it went through a lot of committees to get to where it is, but it's there. Praise the Lord. Because I think it, it's worthy of our attention. Because it calls us to take stock of where our allegiance is. We serve a country that's in great division. And there are many terrible decisions that are being made that are making life very difficult for many people. But how does our allegiance to our country and our allegiance to the one nation under God, how does that actually play out in our everyday practical life? Uh, this is what the Battle Hymn of the Republic drives us to do. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That is our focus, isn't it? It's not on this country becoming some vast, amazing world power that's going to last forever and ever. That's not our vision as Christians. He is trampling out the vintage where grapes of wrath are stored. What in the world is that talking about? There's so many injustices. So many people go to, a, go to the grave without settlement on the score of rights and wrong. One day there will be a settlement, praise the Lord. He had loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. What's that talking about? The end time judgment. Jesus Christ is going to take off his high priestly robes one day, and he's going to say, it is done. That's actually in Revelation. The words, it is done. When it says it is done, that means the plagues are coming, and Jesus is coming with vengeance to finish the work of putting Satan out of commission. Amen? Amen? Glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah. So we're going to sing that song in a minute. But some churches have looked at that and they said, uh-uh, that hymn is not going to wash in our church. They say, we don't sing the battle hymn because we have decided to give our allegiance and worship to Christ alone, rejecting allegiance to any other defeated king, lord, or political entity. Well, that's a decision they had to make. Our church has made it in favor of retaining the battle hymn. We don't sing some of the verses that do talk strictly about arming ourselves to go kill in order to free the slaves. Are you willing to kill for freedom? That, that's a whole other discussion. And our church actually entered into that discussion four years ago. In 2019, they brought many of our leading Theologians are leading commanding officers who are also uh, in military positions, uh, mostly uh, chaplains. And uh, I don't know if uh, Chaplain uh, was there. What was our chaplain was here before? Molina. Molina. I don't know if he was there in 2019, but it was a big convoc convocation. One of the uh, main authors of the book, which you can actually get and look at Adventist and military service, he said, Magyarossi said, Landless, one of the presenters, on this point, and stress 
the need for Adventists to uphold a middle position between strict pacifism and total embrace of combatancy. What is he talking about? <coughs> pacifism would be what? Let them settle their own issues. I'm not getting involved. Was that the position that uh, Desmond Doss took? He didn't have a choice. He was drafted. But did he choose combatancy? No, he rejected it. He became a conscientious objector to that. So our church has had to grapple with this. And uh, one of the main speakers that said, we're going to have to find a middle ground because you take full pacifism, you're irresponsible, really. You take full combatancy, you can be irresponsible there as well. And so our church is still grappling with that. But our, our general conference president made a statement during that time. He said, partnership with God through Jesus Christ, who came to the world to save lives, not destroy, causes Adventists to advocate a non-combatant position following their divine maker, and not taking human life, but rendering all possible service to save it. Praise the Lord. There was, in, the, in World War I, what was that, 1916, right after Ellen White died, uh, World War I broke out. There were drafts of 130 Adventists into the British Army, and they were forced to go to work for the military. But they had a conscience. And they said, we will not bear arms. Well, they were put to hard labor. And not long after that, they were thrown into hard labor camps. Because they couldn't serve in the normal military. They went to, basically, military prison. And during that time of the, civil, uh, of the uh, World War II, the three years or so, they served in hard labor in the camp. But the first Friday they came, and they were seeing the sun set about 4 p.m., they dropped their pitch for their, their pickaxe and their shovel, and uh, what did they do? They went back to their barracks. You think they got the attention of their commanding officers? <laughs> Saturday morning, they heard the latch of their 7 by 4 metal Cage, which they called their room, uh, which was very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. They heard the lats open one by one, and they'd take them out for private interrogation. And they would tell each soldier, come on, come to your senses. This is your country. You've got to support your country. What kind, of a, what kind of a citizen are you? By the way, all your buddies, they said they're going to drop this as a non-issue. They're going to go back to work and be a normal, normal soldier. Well, they interviewed all of those soldiers, and when it all came out, not one of them went back and said, I'm going to go against the allegiance to God. They all held their allegiance to God. They honored the Sabbath, and they didn't bear arms, but they were released just before the war let out. Never had to serve in active duty, but only in the prison camp. Wow. Was that allegiance to their country? Was that allegiance to God? Those are questions you and I have to answer. Jesus had this uh, same thing come up with the Sanhedrin. You can read it in your Bible, John 11, I put it on the screen. What shall we do? This was right after Lazarus. You remember Lazarus, John 11 is the Lazarus story. They had seen Jesus come in from out of out of the uh, district, he'd come in to the, to the district just briefly there, and they hear all these reports, Lazarus was raised from the dead, and many of the even leading class of Pharisees believed, it says there in chapter 11, many of them believed Jesus because of this great miracle. So when the Sanhedrin met, what did they say? What should we do? This man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. You are hearing the voice of the dragon. This country 
is going to be this lamb-like because it was Christian oriented, but it's going to speak as a dragon. These are the words and the, this is where dragon language comes from. Fear that we will lose our place and our nation. That's what's coming. It's happened over and over and over. Are we ready for those days? That's the question. Well, Daniel saw a vision, chapter 2 of the uh, great statue. Let's read it together. In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That includes this one nation under God. But praise God, we do have a strong understanding of what's really going to transpire. And again, you read in Revelation 21 that uh, one nation will be... Let's, let's read it before I finish here. I wanted you to see that in Revelation 21 and uh, verse 22. The temple in heaven is open. And this is where command center is for the universe. The temple in heaven. Verse 22. Right, chapter 21. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. The nations of the earth. So that's Myanmar, Burma. That's Timor-Leste where Becky and I were for five years. That's all of these struggling nations that are having various, uh, various outcomes, and various political <coughs> forces, but praise God there's going to be a gathering of all nations under God. Amen? Let's sing that song. I think it's time. If you may stand and open your hymn book number 647. My eyes have seen the glory. And get ready to sing the song all day because this is that type of song. Six, four, seven. 